has to do with the exclusivity of, of Jesus. Is it too narrow to say that there's only one way to heaven? Is Jesus, in fact, uh, the only way? And so, Lewis, in that room is a stool. Would you mind grabbing that for me? Thank you. It will help, it will help my back greatly. But last week, I want to tie last week to this week a little bit. Last week, we talked about the reliability of the Bible. And we said we can trust that what we have in our Bible has come down to us in a reliable... Oh, here it is. Here it is, Lewis. In a reliable fashion. Because we have MOPS, we have the manuscripts, Old and New Testament. We said in the New Testament, we have thousands of manuscripts. In the Old Testament, the Dead Sea Scrolls give us a great assurance of the quality of what we have. And then we also have the oneness of the message of the Bible, which is that God loves us and he wants to have a forever relationship with us, but because of our sinfulness, we're separated from him. And God has made a plan to bridge that gap by sending Jesus to come and take care of that separation. And he comes and not only comes to earth, but he dies on the cross in our place so we don't have to be separated from God. And in believing in him, we have the opportunity for forgiveness and the right to have eternal life. So that's the one story of the Bible from Genesis all the way through to Revelation. And then uh, we looked at a couple other things, prophecy. And I gave you a separate sheet tonight on prophecies. Uh, these are just a compilation of a long list. There are about 200 messianic prophecies that we know of that involve Jesus in his first coming. And then uh, there are just about as many in his second coming. And so when it comes to prophecy, you know, people ask me this question from time to time. Do you take the Bible literally? And I say, well, I'd rather answer it this way. I take the Bible normally. Whenever I'm studying a passage, okay, I want to ask this question. What did the original writer want for his original audience to get from this? For instance, you know, Jesus says, I am the way and the truth and the life. Well, no one comes to the Father but by me. In, in that passage, what did the, the writer, John, want for us to get? I think he wanted us to get in the context that Jesus was the way to God, the only way to God. But Jesus says some other things. He says, I am the door. Does that mean Jesus was made of wood? No, no, no. So in the natural way that the language is used, uh, the door is the way of access, and that's what Jesus calls himself. He says, I am the good shepherd. Well, as far as we know, Jesus never actually took care of sheep, but it's the idea of being a protector. I am the light of the world. If you're Jewish, you know what that means because you know the context for that. But it doesn't mean Jesus just walked around like a beam-me-up Scotty person all over the planet. So what we want to do when we study prophecies, we want to go back to the context, both in the Old Testament and in, in the New Testament. Because the Scripture itself bears testimony to the fact that the Bible is an inspired book. We can't prove that, but prophecy helps us understand that it's very special and has supernatural qualities. You know, in 2 Timothy, Paul writes to the young pastor, he says, all Scripture, all Scripture, probably referring to mostly the Old Testament, is breathed out by God. That's literally what the Greek says. And it's profitable for four things, teaching, reproof, correction, and training in righteousness. So God doesn't just write us a book. He gives us a love story that's profitable to equip us to walk by faith with him. Isaiah gives us one of those great Old Testament prophecies that you need to be aware of. And, and some a few weeks ago, I think Jim asked, uh, how, what Bible do you use? What is your favorite Bible? And I said, they're all my favorites. But if you'll go to Isaiah 7.14, you'll be able to tell what the editors of your Bible think about prophecy. Isaiah 7.14, it says, Therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, a virgin will be with child and bear a son, and she will call his name Emmanuel. Now, we know that the word virgin in the Hebrew can be taken as a, a woman who's never had sex or a young maiden. It's not nearly a miraculous event if a young maiden gets pregnant, but it's very much a miraculous event if a virgin gets pregnant. And we know that the text implied that virgin was the right translation because Matthew picks it up later in chapter 1, and he actually refers to this passage, and three separate times in the very first chapter of our New Testament, we know that Jesus was born of a virgin. And in the Greek, it's very specific there. The word is specifically virgin. So if you have an Old Testament, usually an Old Revised Standard, or some of the New Jerusalem translations, some of the New Living Things, uh, they may take the Old Testament to say young maiden. Uh, I prefer to take it the way Matthew took it. So that, that's my story, and I'm sticking to it. Another good prophecy is uh, Micah chapter 2, I'm sorry, Micah chapter 5 and verse 2, which is also uh, mentioned in, in Matthew's account in chapter 2 in Matthew, the, the wise men showed up. And they went to the capital city of Jerusalem to look for the king, because that's where the king would live. 
but they knew there was going to be a new king because they had a miraculous intervention. Maybe it was an astro astrological sign. Maybe they had been reading the book of Numbers left behind by Daniel. We just don't know what they saw, but they came and said, where's this new king? And so you remember the story of Herod the Great. He, he called his Bible teachers together, his pastors, his scholars, and he said, hey, where is this new king going to show up? And they turned right to Micah chapter 5 and verse 2, which says what? As for you, Bethlehem, Ephratah, too little to be among the clans of Judah, for, for, for you, from you, one will go forth for me to be a ruler in Israel. His goings forth are from long ago, actually from how long ago? From eternity. So the fact that Jesus has no beginning, he's from eternity, uh, Micah couldn't have understood that even when he wrote it. But the prophecy clearly is used by the New Testament to refer to the fact that Jesus was eternally existent and he was going to be born on the earth in the little city of Bethlehem. So I love prophecy. You can understand that more than half of the Bible was prophetic when it was written. And again, I can't prove to you that the Bible is inspired. I can't show you that it's completely without error, although I believe in the original copies that the authors wrote without error. But I think when you study prophecy, you can really understand there are special things going on with, with the Bible. In 2 Samuel 7, God shows up and he's having a conversation with David. David says, I, I want to build you a temple. I want to build you a house. And you know, when you go to Jerusalem, you can actually visit the house of David. You can visit David's palace. And he had indoor plumbing. There's a toilet right there in the city of David, which was near the kitchen of all places. Uh, but, but God says to David, when your days are complete and you lie down with your fathers, I will raise up your descendant after you who will come forth from you, and I will establish his kingdom. He shall build a house for my name. In other words, you're not going to get to build the temple. Your son Solomon is, but then there's going to be a, a new throne established in your name. I will establish the throne of his kingdom. How long? Forever. So David isn't going to build the temple. Solomon's going to build the temple. But on the throne that David gives to Solomon, there's going to be one who rules forever. Now, again, the very first verse of the New Testament says what? This is the genealogy of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. If Jesus was who he was claiming to be, he had to be directly related by birth to King David. And he was, both through Mary and through Joseph which in and of itself is a miracle because over the years from David's life, David lived in about 900 B.C., think about that, so almost a thousand years before Jesus shows up. Uh, the Jews two different times are kicked out of their land. You know, Once they're, they're kicked out uh, for, uh, for 70 years, and then later after Jesus comes, comes to earth, they're kicked out of their land for 1,900 years. And yet, we know that when Jesus returns, he will be sitting on the throne of David. So we love these, these kind of things that just help us make sense. I did a little Isaiah 53 with you last week. I'm not going to do that again. But one of my favorite psalms is also a psalm of David. You know, the word psalm, and the psalms are right in the middle of your Bible, comes from the Greek word, of, which is the title to the book, called psalmos. Say psalmos. 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 The Hebrew title of the book is Tehillim. It means praises. Because there are 150 psalms in the Psalter, and there's praise in every single psalm except one. Even in the lament psalms, where there's a lot of stuff going on, before the psalm ends, there's a note of praise. Well, Psalm 22 is written by David, and actually in the Hebrew Bible, when it says a psalm of David, that's, that's verse 1. That's part of God's inspired text. We know that when it says a psalm of David that we're to take it that David was the author. And it starts out, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Does that sound familiar to you? Of course it does. Jesus was quoting from this psalm from the cross. When David wrote this psalm in 900 BC, crucifixion was not used by any major kingdom on the earth. So David rules, and then the Babylonians come in, and then the Persians come in, and then the Greeks come in, and then Israel's independent, and then the Romans show up. After 900 years, guess what their method of execution was? Crucifixion. So that the, the prophecies in this psalm could take place in their normal understanding. David continues, verse 7, All who see me sneer at me. Does that sound like what happened to Jesus on the cross? His first three hours on the cross... Different groups of people came and mocked him, sneered at him, said, if you're really who you claim to be, come down from there. 
And then during his last three hours on the cross, the earth gets black and Jesus is then separated from his father. But Jesus, uh, David says 900 years before, they separate with the lip, they wag the head, saying, commit yourself to the Lord, let him deliver him, let him rescue him because he delights in him. So again, David prophetically writes this 900 years before crucifixion is even used on uh, the planet. Later in the psalm, David gives details about crucifixion that absolutely were not done for hundreds of years after. I am poured out like water. All my bones are out of joint. My heart is like wax. It is melted within me. Crucifixion was death by asphyxiation. Especially when they used nails, you would hang by the nails and they would drive the nails into your feet, into your hands. There might be a little place for you to stand, but as you hung there, it was very, very painful, but you would hang. And as you would hang, your diaphragm would collapse and you'd have to breathe. So that's how crucifixion worked. You would push yourself up in order to breathe, but crucifixion was excruciating and took forever. It was very unusual for a person to die in six hours. That's why the Roman soldiers came and checked that he was dead. Because most crucifixions took 24 and even 48, sometimes 72 hours. You know, we have the bones. We have the skeletal remains that have stakes in the ankles and in the wrists. And so Jesus says, I, I can count. All my bones are out of joint. That's because he's hanging there. His skeleton is being stretched. My strength is dried up like a potsherd. My tongue cleaves to my jaws. You died because you were so thirsty and your tongue swelled up and blocked your throat. You couldn't breathe hanging down. So you'd push up and breathe, but the pain was so great in your hands and your feet that then you'd give up for a while. David says, dogs have surrounded me. A band of evildoers has encompassed me. They what? Pierced my hands and my feet. Whew, isn't that amazing? 900 B.C., Jesus is aware of this psalm. Nothing is beyond his control. I can count all my bones. They look, they stare at me. Jesus never had any bones broken. Because a sacrifice in the Jewish world had to be perfect. If you sacrificed a sheep, you had to inspect it. If it had any broken bones, you couldn't sacrifice it. So when Jesus died on the cross, they, they were going to come break his legs. And that was an act of mercy, because if your legs were broken, you couldn't hold yourself up and you would die more quickly. But he says, no, no, they, they, I can, can, can count all my bones. And then verse 18 just blows me away. They divide my garments among them, and for my clothing they what? has lots. So I think prophecy to me, first of all, it's exciting, it's encouraging, and it's a way for me to say, you know, this is not any ordinary book. There's a reason this is the greatest book that's ever been printed in all of history. And so prophecy does that for me. One of the things this book says is what Jesus had to say, gathered by Matthew and Mark and Luke and John. Okay? John was probably the youngest of the 12 disciples, later called the Apostles. And at the end of his life, okay, Jesus gathers the disciples into an upper room, and he makes this incredible, exclusive statement. Jesus said, I'm going to go away. And Thomas said, wait a minute, we don't know where you're going. Where are you going to go? And Jesus said, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. So people read that and they say, wow, isn't that a narrow statement? It is, it is a narrow statement. And here's the balance of being a follower of Christ. It's okay to have a narrow position on something, but it's not okay to be narrow-minded. <laughs> you can be so narrow-minded that you can look through a keyhole with both eyes. And so God wants us to love the people that don't know Christ. God wants us to have good information for them, but God wants us to present it in a way that makes sense and is kind and loving because it's a very exclusive statement. You know, there are a lot of these kinds of questions. Aren't all, since our religions are basically the same, does it matter what you believe? especially our kids and our grandkids live in this world. Isn't the choice of religion just a matter of your personal preference? Most of the world is not Christian. How can they all be wrong? Christ may be your only way, but how can you claim that he's the only way for everybody? You know, in, in, in the world where my grandkids live, it's everybody has their own truth. So how do you answer that question? Is Jesus, in fact, giving us an exclusive statement? More people tend to say, well... The golden rule is the most important thing. It's like we're all climbing up different paths on the same mountain. And, and the idea is we're all going to the same place, whether you're a Buddhist or a Hindu or a Muslim or fill in the blank. The important thing is that you're climbing and that you're being kind to other people. Well, kindness is a good virtue. And one of the things that we know about all religions is there's, there's kind of a quality of 
how we should behave toward other people in all of them. And kindness in, is involved in that. But each one of them has specific things that are, that are different. And what I hope to show you tonight is that it's okay that Jesus made some exclusive statements. Uh, because all religions, not only do they not go up the mountain the same way, they're not even on the same mountain. So I gave you a handout, and there are three options when you deal with this, unless you want to use this bumper sticker. Is Christianity too exclusive? You have three choices, as I understand them, in dealing with this. First of all, there are many people that call themselves Christians that say Christianity is not exclusive. Okay? Most of the liberal denominations, both Protestant and Catholic, would say everybody gets in. You know, every, everybody's going to get a chance at some point, whether it's a first chance or a second chance, everybody's, everybody's going to get in. So Christianity is not an exclusive way. God loves the whole world, and the whole world is safe because God's going to take them all to heaven however they get there. But when you study the Scripture, it's important to understand that uh, Christianity... Uh, rises and falls about on the person of Jesus. And he made some, some pretty exclusive statements. He made some pretty narrow statements. John 3.16 is the most popular verse in the New Testament, which is very inclusive. See, Christianity is not exclusive when it comes to the who. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him won't perish but have eternal life. But you know, two verses later, <laughs> we read this. He who believes in him, Jesus, is not judged. He who does not believe has been judged already because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. So whoever wants can believe, but if you don't believe, <laughs> you might be in trouble here. Another verse that talks about the exclusivity is John 8, 24. Jesus says to the people who are going to stone the woman taken in adultery. He says, I say therefore to you that you shall die in your sins, for unless you believe that I am he, then you shall die in your sins. Now I am he is the Hebrew way of saying what? I'm God. And so the Jews were really upset because Jesus clearly was a man, but he's claiming to be God, and he's claiming to be the only way to have forgiveness and the only way to, to get up the mountain. Jesus also mentioned it in John 14, 9, he who has seen me has seen the Father. What is God like? Well, we know what God's like because he's come down and he's lived here on earth for a number of years, and we, we have people who recorded what, what God is like. John 10.30, 10, uh, 10, I and the Father are one. So Jesus makes some pretty spectacular claims. The fact is, he makes an exclusive claim. He says, I'm the way and the truth and the life. You don't get in except through me. And then the disciples come along as his followers, and they affirm those claims. Thomas in John chapter 20, after he put his hands in the holes of Jesus' marks of the crucifixion, said, you're my Lord and my God. You know, he saw the resurrection firsthand and he felt the holes in the wrists and the, and the, and the feet of Jesus and he said, you've got to be who you claim to be. Peter in Acts 4.12, as the church is beginning, says there is salvation in no one else for there is no other name under heaven that has been given among men by which we must be saved. So Jesus made exclusive claims, and the apostles made exclusive claims, and interestingly enough, Jesus' enemies made exclusive claims. When they referred to Christ, John 10, 31, the Jewish leaders picked up stones to stone Jesus, but Jesus said to them, I have shown you many great miracles from the Father, for which of these do you stone me? Well, we're not stoning you for any of these, replied the Jews, but for blasphemy, because you, a mere man, claim to be what? God. So Jesus makes these claims, his disciples affirm the claims, his enemies got it. His enemies always knew what Jesus was saying. I have people often say to me, well, Jesus never claimed to be God. Well, he did in, in actual verbiage a few times, but almost every miracle in the New Testament is designed to show that he has God and his authority comes from God and God alone. And either he is who he claimed to be or he is not. So I think if you study the Bible, and I would encourage you to do that for your own, on your own. There's nothing to be hidden here. I'm working with it, with a guy through it right now, and there's some really wonky stuff in the Bible. <laughs> He's reading the book of Judges now, and he calls me every day. Whew. We're having a great time with it. But there's some hard stuff in there. But the reality is, if you read the New Testament, it's pretty clear that Christianity is exclusive. Well, then the next question is, is it exclusive and therefore wrong? Because, again, we live in the world of tolerance. Our 
culture worships at the altar of inclusiveness and tolerance. Nobody's wrong. Everybody's right. It's all good. You have your own deal. I'm not here to judge. That's what we, that's what we hear in the culture. And so let's look at that for just a minute. People who hold that Christianity is wrong because it's exclusive make three wrong assumptions. The first one is that sincerity makes something true. Some of you guys are old enough to remember a guy by the name of Jim Marshall. Remember Jim Marshall? Who was he? Football yeah, a football player. Played for the Minnesota Vikings in the 70s. I have a good friend that was the middle, middle linebacker on that team that lost four Super Bowls. Near the end of one of their championship seasons, Jim Marshall was playing defensive end, and he picked up a fumble, and he ran 65 yards for a touchdown to the wrong end zone. <laughs> he was sincere. He believed he was doing right, but he was dead wrong. His teammates were yelling, no, Jim, no, and he thought they were yelling, go, Jim, go. <laughs> You can be sincere, and it's a wonderful uh, quality, but it doesn't make you right or wrong. It's just a nice thing to have. Some of you in this church know Don Hubbard, one of my dear friends forever. But I don't know if you've been around Don much, but get him some time to tell you some of the weird things that happened to Don. One time years ago, Don was mowing his lawn. It was the summer, and he came in sweating bullets, exhausted, extremely overheated, and on the table, Sarah had put a pitcher of lemonade. So Don goes to the refrigerator, fills a big glass full of ice, pours the lemonade in his glass, and chugs it. And about the third gulp realizes, this is not lemonade. This is Clorox. Sarah was cleaning out the iced tea pitcher from the stains, and she put the Clorox in the iced tea pitcher to get rid of the stains. Now Don sincerely believed he was going to drink lemonade, but he almost died being sincere. <laughs> He was sincere, but wrong. Our son, Matty, when he was three, many of you know Matty, uh, he used to think if he wore his Superman underoos and got a blue towel and pinned it to his shoulders, he could fly. Now, Matty was not only sincere, he was stupid. <laughs> we lived on a side hill, and we had a little terrace in the hill, and he would run off the hill, and he'd take off, and boom. First time, he, you know, he's got dirt in his nose and his eyes and his ears, and he's brushing himself off, and he dusts himself off, climbs back up the terrace, and he does it again. <laughs> Gwen's watching this out the window, and about the fourth try, he's climbed up in the top of the grapefruit tree, and he's going to jump out of the tree. He was sincere. He was wrong. So sincerity does not make something right. There are a lot of sincere people in the world who believe the wrong stuff. And you can too. A second false assumption is that believing something made it true. Believing in that towel did not make Matty fly. The entire civilized world used to believe that the earth was what? Flat. That didn't make it flat. So believing it doesn't make it right, doesn't make it wrong. It just is that's, that's what you uh, believe. I used to believe in Santa Claus. I hope no one here still does. I'm oh, sorry. <laughs> You know, and, and, and at a point in time, I realized, you know, it didn't matter how much I believed in him, he wasn't real. It's a nice idea. There's nothing inherently evil about Santa Claus, I don't think. Um, although Gwen might have some ideas about that. Uh, and then third, false assumption is that exclusivity makes something false. That if you are narrow about something, then you're wrong. Well, there are times when being narrow is a good thing. You know, when I fly in an airplane and I land at Tampa International Airport, I want a pilot that is narrow-minded. When they tell them to land on runway 29 from the north, I don't want him on runway 39 from the east. And when he lands, I don't want him on the side of the runway. I don't want one, one wheel on the, on the concrete and one wheel on the grass. I want him right on that line. I want him to be, to be narrow. The fact is, uh, all truth is narrow. But we worship in our culture at the altar of tolerance. There's nothing wrong with tolerance. It's not a bad thing to be tolerant. But the reality is all religions are exclusive. And I put a little summary for you on the back of the page, and I'm not going to spend a lot of time there if you want. Uh, the best thing to do is, if, if you have questions about a particular way of belief, 
you can, you can find uh, in, in a dictionary or an encyclopedia, you can Google Hinduism, and it'll tell you what Hinduism thinks. Ask the question, what is their idea of what God is like? What is their idea of what mankind is like? And how do you get from man to God? You know, in Hinduism, God is kind of like the ocean. And if you're good enough, you undergo a series of reincarnations and you become one with the ocean. God is not a personal being. You just become part of this mass of what everything is God. Uh, Buddhism is a little bit like that, but their idea of God is not the ocean. Their, their idea of God is you reincarnate into total nothingness. Uh, which, again, I mentioned this when we did the study on, on why bad things happen, but that's why the Hindus and the Buddhists, generally when there's a natural disaster, they don't help. Because you're simply getting karma for what you did in your last life if you're in the middle of a tragedy right now. So it runs against their worldview to help when there's a devastating, devastating thing that happens in their neighborhood. It's, it, it really keeps you from reincarnating in a better place. You know, many Jews don't believe there's any heaven at all. There's three major divisions in Judaism and smaller divisions within each of those. But a lot of the Jews are secular or non-observant Jews. They're the Reformed Jews. And they don't believe in an afterlife at all. Uh, the rabbi that was across the lake for a long time, if you'd listen to him do a funeral, this was all you get. There's no hope of an afterlife. Okay. Uh, many Jews believe that if there is a Messiah, it's really the nation Israel, and they're bringing peace to the world that way. They, they allegorize all of their scripture. The Muslim says, hey, you know, life stinks and then you die. But if you're good while life stinks, you end up in, in, a, in an eternal paradise with 72 virgins. Woohoo! And if you don't think these groups are narrow, then you ask one of their clerics if you could raise their child according to your faith. They will have nothing to do with that. See, all religions are exclusive. So the question is, what do you do with that? Well, we want to be tolerant. You know, tolerance, again, is a good category. Here's the, here's the definition from the dictionary. Tolerance is the capacity to endure pain or hardship, endurance, fortitude, stamina, also sympathy or indulgence for one's belief or practices differing from one's own. And notice the verbs used in this definition. Endure, put up with, suffer, allow, permit, indulge. You know, I made the mistake last Valentine's Day. I got a, I got a card for Gwen. It said, Dear Gwen, I tolerate you. <laughs> no, it didn't. And you would be upset if somebody was just tolerating you. I'm just kidding, dear. But there are different kinds of tolerance. And it's important to understand that, especially as you talk to your grands and your kids and the people around us that we care about. There's legal tolerance. We live in a country which is blessed, that you can hold any idea that you want, even if it's opposed to mine. I believe that Jesus is the way to heaven. If you don't believe that, you have the right not to believe that. You can be an atheist, a Buddhist, a Muslim, practice Baha'i, whatever it is you want to be. If you believe that a fried egg attached to your ear will get you to heaven, you have the legal right to do that, and I will be tolerant of that. I will also be socially tolerant, because I believe that all people are created in the image of God. And as a result... They ought to be respected and cared for and loved and nurtured because God made them with a piece of him in them. All people should be cared for socially. So that's the respect and kindness shown to somebody holding a, di a different idea than me. 1 Corinthians 13, Paul says, If I speak in the tongues of men and of angels, but I have not love, I'm a noisy gong and a clanging cymbal. If I have all power and all knowledge, but I have not love, I'm nothing. So our approach to people needs to be what Jesus' approach to people was. He loved them. There were times he called them out, but he's willing to keep the relationship and keep the discussion going and not just write them off. The world we live in is full of intellectual tolerance, and that's the danger. Intellectual tolerance says, and your kids get this and your grandkids get this, the view that any idea is valid. And the logical extension of that is what Putin is doing in Ukraine is every bit as valid as what Mother Teresa did in India. Because you have an idea, and it's your idea, and it's your truth, they're all equally valid. The problem with intellectual tolerance is it just doesn't work for this reason. Legal tolerance is based on our freedom. Social tolerance is based on our value. But the problem with intellectual tolerance is 2 plus 2 is 5, right? Wrong. 
See, there's a thing in theology and philosophy that I want to share with you. If someone believes that 2 plus 2 is 5, they have the, the social and the legal right to believe that. They do. They can believe it legally and they can believe it socially. But they're correct intellectually. 2 plus 2 equals 5, right? What do you think, accountant? Yeah, that's the problem with accountants. You must have been a lawyer first. No, 2 plus 2 is not 5. See, you have opposite statements occurring called the law of non-contradiction. Say non-contradiction. Non-contradiction says if you have two opposing statements, either A is true and B is false, or B is true and A is false, or they both can be false, but they both can't be true. By the way, one of my dear friends in this church came to Christ through understanding the, the, the law of non-contradiction. Many of you know him. So, for instance, years ago, my mom, God rest her soul, had this miserable dog with three legs. It was a small poodle. She loved that poodle. I didn't mind the poodle except whenever I came to visit, the poodle was... <laughs> didn't matter if I fed the dog, loved the dog, petted the dog. Didn't matter if I was there 15 minutes earlier. If I went to my mom's door... <laughs> uh, uh, thank you. You've been non-contradicted. So my mom, I asked her, you know, why do you keep this dog? She said, well, I keep the dog because it's a poodle, and poodles do not shed. But nevertheless, when I left my mom's house, if I was wearing dark, dark pants, I'm here to tell you, there was poodle hair on my pants. <laughs> so now we have two contradictory statements. Either poodles shed and all dogs shed, or poodles don't shed and all dogs shed. You can't have them both. They can't both be right. And so that's what the law of non-contradiction does. Either Jesus is right and the Hindus are wrong, or the Hindus are, wrong, are right and Jesus is wrong, but they both can't be right because they make opposite statements about who man is, who God is, and how one gets to connect with the other. So intellectual tolerance is the world that we live in. You have to abide by, you know... <laughs> You know, we live in, I, I could just go on and on, but I won't. But the world says, hey, it's okay for your six-year-old to question their sexuality. Really? And, you know, I just think that all truth is absolute truth. And here's the fact. When it comes to faith systems, whether you're a Hindu, a Buddhist, a Muslim, a Jew, or a Christian, faith is only as good as the object of that faith. Faith is only as good as as its object. So there were two guys in Colorado. It was December. They were hunting. It, the sun went down early. It was four o'clock in the afternoon. And Billy says to Bubba, they were from Polk County. <laughs> Billy says, Bubba, we better get back to the cabin. And Bubba says, we don't have to be in a hurry. We'll just walk across the lake. Billy says, you can't walk across the lake. It's, it's water. Bubba says, yeah, but it's been cold. It's December. It's 18 inches of ice. And so Bubba walked across the lake and he got home in plenty of time. Billy didn't have much faith in that lake. But because the object of his faith was solid, on all fours he started. And before long, he felt free to walk across the lake. Now, the same two guys are in the same cabin five months later, April, May. The sun is going down. Billy says to Bubba, we better get back. Bubba says, yeah, it's going to take a while. We've got to walk around the lake. Billy says, no, no, we'll walk across the lake. It worked before. Bubba says, no, it's made of water. The ice is very thin. Billy says, watch. And he walks out onto the lake, and in two steps, he's soaking wet. That time he had a lot of faith. But the object of his faith was not solid. The great thing is, when it comes to Christianity, it rises and falls on who Jesus is. So who did Jesus claim to be? He claimed to be the Son of God who would die for our sins, and he's coming back again. Did he lie about that? You know, this is the, called the trilemma, developed by C.S. Lewis most popularly. Did Jesus really think he was God, going to offer sacrifice for the sins of the world, and he knew he wasn't? He was lying. Well, that doesn't make a lot of sense, but some people believe he was a liar. Doesn't go along with the rest of his teaching, by the way, but that's what people believe. Or maybe he really thought he was God. He really thought he was going to die for the sins of the world, but he wasn't God. He was just a guy. He was a good guy. But do the teachings of Christ that we know of line up with what a lunatic would share? Not for me, they don't. 
So the other option that I know of, he's, he's probably the Lord. You know, when I look at the evidence I've got, faith is not the absence of doubt. Faith is the decision I make based on the evidence that I got. I asked Lewis to get me this stool because the evidence suggested me for the last two weeks this stool held up my fat old body. I exercised faith when I sat down. It was good because the object of my faith would hold me up. And the object of our faith is the Lord Jesus. Christianity is true. And because of that, we can share the gospel with great confidence, knowing that the object of our faith stands and falls with the person of Jesus. So I want to close in prayer, and then we'll do Q&A, and I'm here as long as you want. But there's just one last thing. One last thing. If there are more ways to get to God than through Jesus, why would God kill his only son? Good question, isn't it? Father, we are so blessed that you sent your one and only perfect son to be our sacrifice on the cross. And we are so thankful that through him we have forgiveness, we have the assurance of eternal life, and we have the opportunity to be a part of your forever family. So we pray that you'd make us worthy of the message, worthy of the faithfulness that you have shown on our behalf, that as we go through our day and meet with people that don't, don't agree with us in so many ways, that we would love them and have opportunities to interact with them and share with them uh, things that would be helpful in their journey to faith. We just commit ourselves to that end in Jesus' name. Amen.